to today's webinar titled, What is Accreditation and Do Family-Run Organizations Need It? Um, my name is Mrs. Sweeney, and I'm coordinating this webinar for Fredla. Uh, today's webinar is the second in a two-part series on this important topic. It's being provided today as a technical assistance opportunity as part of the TA network. The TA network is a partnership with three other universities and seven organizations you see listed here. The TA network provides technical assistance to the child, adolescent, and family branch of SAMHSA's Center for Mental Health Services and to grantees of the Children's Mental Health Initiative across the nation to support states and communities to expand and sustain their systems of care for children, youth, young adults, and their families. The Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, or FREDLA, is a new national organization focused on building the leadership and organizational capacity of family-run organizations. FREDLA, incorporated in 2013, was started by 16 executive directors who recognized the need for a peer-led organization whose focus was on enhancing, expanding, and elevating family-run organizations as an industry. As a result, FREDLA was born. Fredla's mission is to strengthen leadership and organizational capacity of family-run organizations focused on the well-being of children and youth with mental health, emotional, or behavioral challenges, and their families. Fredla provides technical assistance to system of care grantees in the form of webinars, topic-specific consultations, site visits, resource materials, leadership camps, and much more. Fredlow is excited that you've chosen to join us today to hear about the timely topic of accreditation and what it means for family-run organizations. I'm leading this as a principal partner of Family Solutions Consulting, and I'm contracted by Fredlow for the project. So I hope you enjoy what we have to offer today. Today's webinar is part two of a two-part series on accreditation. We will have an overview of accreditation, followed by a presentation from Leslie Ellis Lang on the process through CARF International. We'll then hear from Frances Purdy from Excellence in Family Support on her experience in assisting CARF in the development of their new peer support standards, which were just released on July 1 of this year, and how this could benefit family-run organizations. There will be a question-answer period following Friends' presentation. So what is accreditation? It means an accrediting agency has determined that an organization has met specific requirements and standards in the organization's field of services. In this case, we're referring to mental health. Accrediting agency refers to an agency which has developed clinical, financial, and organizational standards for the operation of a provider of mental health services and which evaluates an organization's compliance with its established standards on a regularly scheduled basis. Additionally, there are states that have their own accreditation processes, and some states that require accreditation through a national or international agency. The terms accreditation and certification are sometimes used interchangeably, however, they are not synonymous. Accreditation is a stamp of approval from a third-party review of an agency's operations and infrastructure. It applies to an organization it refers to the agency's practices in areas of finance, personnel, credentials, service structure, and policies and procedures. Certification, on the other hand, is used for verifying that personnel have adequate credentials to practice certain disciplines. It is a comprehensive evaluation of a skill typically measured against some existing norm or standard. Certification is the verification that a candidate has successfully completed an evaluation of his or her knowledge, skills, and abilities against a specific standard. Individuals that provide appropriate documentation of their experience and successfully pass a certification exam are considered certified. Industry and or trade associations will often create certification programs to test and evaluate the skills of those performing services within the interest area of that association. There's definite value in being an accredited organization. There's a focus on quality and performance of the organization. It offers value at several levels, 
Um, it's with personnel. It assists in improving quality and meeting national standards in the service field for payers and funders. There's a recognition that the organization is accountable and a good steward of funds. For the state, it signals that an organization is structurally sound and committed to improving quality services to targeted populations. And for the public, consumers and families are aware that the organization strives to provide high quality services and support. So accreditation establishes expectations for staff and management, sets health and safety standards, supports quality improvement, and provides the community with confidence in the organization. Do family-run organizations need to be accredited? This differs from state to state. Some states or state agencies are requiring accreditation for contracting now. There's a changing marketplace dynamic that necessitates a change in the business strategy to address competition for funding and to be competitive across the board for services. Medicaid plans are requiring a process to ensure providers and provider organizations are properly credentialed to provide services, and accreditation is one way to do that. Although states differ on behavioral health policies and regulations, accreditation does offer a uniform set of standards and a set of expected organizational behaviors. In an environment where funding is scarce and funders are being pressured to demonstrate sound fiscal decisions tied to outcomes when they provide dollars, accreditation becomes an important factor and one that we should explore and consider. However, family-run organizations are not traditional mental health facilities and tend to have differing structures, are mission-based, and place high value on lived experience rather than educational credentials. Accreditation processes are typically from a more clinical or medical model of service delivery. So becoming accredited can present some unique opportunities and challenges to family-run organizations. Let's look for a moment at the potential benefits and considerations of undertaking the process of becoming accredited. As a family-run organization, there are benefits to becoming accredited. There's recognized value among funders and other providers. It gives you a competitive edge for funding opportunities. It boosts public confidence in services and organizational structure. A benefit is that it offers the opportunity to strengthen processes and procedures internally. And it's a visible demonstration of the organization's commitment to quality. There are also some things to consider as you explore the possibility of accreditation. Accreditation standards for programming and staff are typically clinically driven. Personnel training, education, and credentials are different in family-run organizations than in your traditional service provider. Lack of standards for non-traditional services typically provided aren't present in accredited accreditation processes now. And there's the cost of accreditation, both monetary and time. There are several accrediting bodies in our field. There's state accreditation. There are national accreditations, such as the Joint Commission, the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, known as ACHC, the Council on Accreditation, known as COA, and also CARF International. To better inform you of the world of accreditation, this webinar series focuses on the two most likely accreditations for family-run organizations, and that's COA and CARF, as they focus on community-based services most closely related to the work of family-run organizations. In part one, we focused on COA. And today, we will hear from Leslie Ellis Lang about CARF accreditation. Now I'd like to welcome Leslie Ellis Lang, Man Managing Director of Child and Youth Services at CARF International. She'll provide an introduction to the CARF process, the supports offered to organizations as they become accredited, and the basic cost of becoming CARF accredited. Leslie? Thank you, Millie. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to go over a few things about CARF and why I think CARF is a good fit for family-run organizations. First, we're going to go over a little bit about CARF in general. We're going to talk about the accreditation survey process, including fees and the kind of support that CARF offers organizations and programs that wish to be accredited. And then we're going to talk specifically about peer, family, and the youth support standards that were just recently developed. 
Whenever I talk about CARF, I always begin with talking about CARF's mission. And this is because everything that CARF does is about enhancing the lives of persons served. And that fits so well with family-run organizations, because I know that family-run organizations are all about ensuring that people who have any kinds of behavioral health issues, that's what your goal is. And with CARF, everything we do, whether it's about our standards, it's the development of their, our standards, the way we measure success is by looking at the number of persons served in CARF accredited organizations. And we do this through a consultative process. When CARF goes in to survey an organization, it's not just a matter of seeing whether or not they conform to the standards, but it's about helping an organization actually improve the services so that persons served in that organization can have better services and improve their lives. A little bit about CARF. We were established as a nonprofit first in 1966. We, were, we are currently recognized in about 48 states, either under mandates or deemed status. And really what that means is that within each of the states, there are requirements for accreditation, or deemed status means that the authority figure recognizes that CARF accreditation meets particular, particular guidelines or authori authoritative regulations, so they don't have to go out and audit or monitor that organization as frequently. The standards that CARF has apply to both small organizations in rural areas as well as larger urban organizations. And as a prior CARF surveyor, I remember doing an organization, surveying an organization that was just two people, two small people. So if you think about having to wear a number of hats in, in your organization, you can imagine how many hats those folks had, had to wear. And then survey, sur some surveys actually have, oh, I've seen um, organizations, we only survey for two or three days. Some of our surveys have 15, 20 surveyors for those three days, so they're quite large. Surveyors may actually start in different states and may never actually go to one site, but do their exit conferences over, over a teleconference or a webinar similar to this. CARF has about 1,400 surveyors in our cadre and about 100 CARF staff members. Our corporate office is located in Tucson, Arizona. We have another office in Washington, D.C., two offices in Canada, and actually currently um, this week signed on the dotted line for our newest office in, in London. And I just did say London. We're actually in 18 countries. You know, and that, that really speaks to the fact of, of our standards not being prescriptive. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we have a number of different accreditation areas. And I know we're talking today primarily about children, youth, and family services in mental health. So we have standards that cover behavioral health areas. O OTP stands for Opioid Treatment Programs. Child and Youth Services. Child and Youth Services Standards Manual covers behavioral health. It covers child welfare. It also covers healthy development. We have standards for employment and community services. And those standards cover people who have cognitive disabilities. It covers employment services and other services typically offered in the community. We have medical rehabilitation standards, things such as stroke rehab, brain injury, and we also have standards that covers aging services, such as adult day services and assisted living. And as I mentioned, we measure our success by looking at how many people are served in CARF accredited organizations. Because if a person is served in a CARF accredited organization, we know that there are certain standards in place to help them reach their potential and achieve optimal outcomes. So right now, we have about 6,700 organizations that have CARF accredited programs. And about 49,000 individual programs actually have CARF accreditation. A 
Our standards are field driven to continually reflect best practices. And we're going to talk a little bit about field driven when I talk about standards development. You know, when Millie began the webinar and she spoke about some common features of accreditation and the overall value, she spoke about how, you know, we talked in the first part about learning about another accrediting body. But one of the one of the key features about CARF is about our standards and how our standards are developed and field driven. And we, when we get to talk about how our peer, youth, and family support standards are field driven, and I'm glad Fran is here with us today to talk firsthand about how we developed our peer, youth, and family support standards, you'll get a real flavor of, of the dynamics that happened in that meeting. Our surveyors are peers. They work in accredited organizations for a minimum of five years, and they have direct experience in the delivery and administration of those specific programs. Our process is consultative and represents ongoing partnership in quality improvement. And that's a key factor of CARF accreditation, that consultation. And one of the other areas that CARF is different than any other accrediting body is that with CARF, you have a choice of which programs you wish to include in a survey. So, for example, in a family-run organization, you may provide oh, advocacy services. You could provide case management services, maybe some skill training. Maybe you're manning a crisis line. Some of those services you might be able to bill Medicaid for. Some of them not. And with CARF, you can choose which of those services you wish to have accredited. With any other accreditor, you would have to accredit all of your services, whether or not you have to. And that's a true advantage. It's an advantage for a couple of different reasons. Number one, you're as strong as your weakest link. Maybe you've done one of those services for the, for the entire time you've had your organization running. So it's had time to mature, to really get fine-tuned. Another one of those services, maybe you just developed. And it hasn't been running very long. And you did it recently to, because perhaps you just got a grant and you knew that there was a need in the community. But with any kind of accreditation, you're always as strong as your weakest link. Would you want to put your strongest program at risk for that program that you just developed in your whole survey? I think not. The other reason you might want to consider the choice of programs as really being a benefit is cost. Well, we'll talk more about CARF's cost in a little while, um, which really differs in, in the process than any other accrediting body. And I mentioned a little bit about CARF being consultative versus prescriptive. Our surveyors, CARF surveyors, are actually trained to be able to provide organizations and programs the opportunity to get better. You know, they could already be meeting our standards, but because our surveyors are selected specifically for the programs that you are providing, even if you're already meeting a standard, they'll be happy to offer you ways that you can even improve on what you're doing. And if you're not meeting the standard, they'll share ways that other organizations very similar to yours can meet that standard. So you will actually have takeaways that, that offer value. You know, and CARF recognizes that there's multiple ways to conform to standards. You know, I mentioned that we're, we have um, programs accredited in 18 countries. We know that, that organizations and people being served and um, things differ from country to country, state to state, town to town within states. We can't expect that every program in every location is going to be able to meet person's needs the same way. You know, consider, consider a small town in Alaska that's maybe providing, oh, family to family services and actually going out to see families to help engage them in services. But in Alaska, you know, the only way in the wintertime to get to a family's home is by snow machine. They may only 
be able to see one family a day because it takes almost a whole day to get to see that family. On the other hand, let's say inner city New York, that family might be able to see six families in a day because they could all be located in the same building. With CARF, we don't have any particular caseload standards. You know, it's really up to the organization to be able to set guidelines for things such as caseloads, for things such as educational requirements. Because what's meaningful to that organization and those people being served is important depending on where you're located and who the people are you're providing. So we recognize that there has to be multiple pathways to conformance. And fee structure. Oh, let's just talk about that separately. You know, I mentioned that CARF is different than other accreditors, licensing, audits, and inspections. You know, our on-site consultation, as I said, it's, it's really there to enhance the quality of programs. It's not an I got you process. It's not to find something wrong. It's to be able to improve the services that you are currently providing. During the survey, we are offering technical assistance. We're going to allow you to explore various ways to conform to the standards. And this is kind of a chart to take a look at the different steps that are required for accreditation. And the time frames that I put down with these steps, they're very approximate. And it really depends on on your organization, how long you've been around, have you ever been through any kind of auditing, monitoring, licensing before. So let's just go through these very briefly. The first thing you would want to do in the CARF process would be to consult with the resource specialist. And the resource specialist is someone who would basically be become your best friend. We'll talk just a little bit more in detail about them in just a minute. And I'll actually give you some guidelines on who that might be for wherever you are in this country. And then you're going to conduct a self-evaluation. And a self-evaluation is basically an opportunity for you to take a look at how well you are currently meeting the standards. It's a process that you do for yourself. It is not something that you do and turn into CARF. It's not a form that you have to fill out. It doesn't require that you send CARF multiple documents. It's truly a self-evaluation. And you might want to do this as soon as you decide to become CARF accredited. Because once you start preparing, you don't want to think of the CARF standards as very linear, going through each standard and preparing actions to be able to meet that particular standard. Because as you go through the standards, you'll see that some tie into each other. And you don't want to prepare action in one direction only to find out that there's another standard in a couple pages down that also would be something that you can make perhaps one policy or procedure rather than two. And then about four months or so down the road, you know, I typically suggest about six you want to submit your application for survey. And when you submit your application for survey, this is something that will give CARF the information needed to determine how many surveyors for two or three days and what expertise those surveyors will need to be able to come out and provide your organization a good, thorough, complete survey with the proper consultation. And once you have that application, that's when we're going to be able to invoice your fees. And I keep talking about fees. Don't worry, I'm getting to cost in just a minute. We select the surveyor team. And again, we select them based on the programs, who you are as an organization. For example, if you're rural, we're going to pick surveyors who are familiar with rural organizations. Um, organizations, we have some organizations that perhaps are all Native American. We'll pick surveyors who, if not are Native American themselves, are very familiar with the Native American culture. It could be a specific ethnicity. It could be a specific language. But we're going to match our surveyors so that they are going to be able to 
understand who you are as an organization. And as a family-run organization, we're going to make sure that those surveyors know family-run organizations. Either they are going to be family members or be close enough to have family members involved or have in their own organizations have family-run types of services or family supporters within their organization. Once we select the survey team, you'll also then be notified who that team is. And then you have your survey. And then after the survey, after the surveyors leave your site, you'll get the outcome of the survey approximately six to eight weeks afterwards. And after the results of the survey, we will ask that you submit a quality improvement plan. And what that is is what actions are you going to take to what we call recommendations. And a recommendation are those areas that we saw where you are not in conformance to standards. And you'll note that I say the word conformance, not compliance. We let other reviewers and auditors look for compliance, but CARF looks for conformance. And every year in between your surveys, and CARF does have outcomes, um, our maximum survey accreditation is for three years. Every three years, every year in between that, we ask for an annual conformance to quality report. And that basically tells us that you will be continuing to utilize the CARF standards. And then we just ask that you main co maintain contact with us on an ongoing basis. And there's a few different criteria in which we would want you to notify us if there's changes of location or ownership, et cetera. And I put this chart in here. So you can have an idea of when you would want to put in your applica application should you choose CARF to be your accreditor. So let's say you wanted to have a survey in the December, January time frame. You would look on that first column down to December, January, and then you would see that the intent, or what we now call the application, would then be due to CARF right around August 31st. That last column, expiration month, that would be for organizations that are currently accredited, um, typically with another accrediting body. And if their organization was, um, their accreditation was expiring in a particular month, we would want to make sure we'd work backwards. If their accreditation was expiring, let's say in December, we would want to have their application due by June. And I mentioned the resource specialist back in, in step one. Um, you know, another point about resource specialists, they will become your key contact once you are looking to learn more about CARF after today's call, um, or if you've decided to use CARF to look to see which programs you wish to accredit, or perhaps you're having some difficulty understanding the intent of the standards. Your resource specialist would be the person to call. And what's really nice about having those conversations with your resource specialist is they will ensure that your conversation is recorded in a manner of something we call Customer Connect. So if you call them and you ask them about what does this particular standard mean, and you get an answer and you follow that, and the surveyors come in and they question you about how you went about trying to meet that standard, you can say, wait a minute here. This is what our resource specialist told us. Can't we call? And you go ahead and call, and the resource specialist has it right there in writing, saying, yep, that's what I told them. So it's, it's one of those, um, I guess I'll be frank, CYA kinds of opportunities where, where you've got everything written down and covered. Um, I put down here, resource specialist will set you up in Customer Connect. Customer Connect is a, oh, went ahead of myself, sorry. Customer Connect is an online portal that you will be able to get information back and forth from your resource specialist 
It's where you will have linkages to your online application. You will be able to get information about your standards and about your survey. And it will also give you an opportunity to be able to connect with your resource specialist at all hours of the day and night. And this is a map of um, the US and Canada and who your resource specialist would be. So let's say you're in, oh, I don't know where some of you folks are, but let's say in Texas, then your resource specialist would be Emily. And don't let the, the, um, the split of resource specialists, what looks um, uneven, were you because we made those splits based on the number of organizations that are currently accredited in those areas. So in the Midwest and in the East, we have many more organizations that are accredited. Therefore, um, we, we have given them less territory to cover. And earlier I mentioned a, the accreditation outcome. And I talked about the three-year outcome. The three-year outcome is the highest level of accreditation that you can receive from CARF. And it's also the most frequent. I would say approximately 80% of first-time organizations that go through the CARF accreditation process do wind up with a three-year accreditation. Now you're thinking, maybe. Um, well, I don't know if I even like those odds. I don't want to go through this process and take the chance of not becoming accredited. Well, those organizations that typically don't wind up with a three-year accreditation are the ones that sometimes go through the process kicking and screaming and don't even take the time to prepare. You know, when I was a surveyor and I'd walk into an organization and ask to see the executive director and they tell me the executive director is out on vacation, that kind of tells me about the commitment to the CARF process. Or I start walking around the organization and talking to staff members and they look at my standards manual and they say, what is that book you keep referring to? And I know they've never even looked at a standards manual. That tells me, again, something about their commitment to the CARF process. But organizations who take the time, who who attend training, who look at the standards, typically get a three-year accreditation. And that really means not that they're conforming to all of the standards. Many times organizations have many, many recommendations and still wind up with a three-year accreditation. A one-year accreditation is for organizations that have areas of deficiency but surely show an a evidence of the capability and commitment to meet those standards within a year. A provisional accreditation is for organizations only after they've received a one-year accreditation and for some reason were not able then to achieve a three-year accreditation. It would be for some kind of circumstance that was beyond their control. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, organizations, for example, near the New Orleans area who may have received a one-year accreditation and were due to have their resurvey right around the time when Katrina hit. Well, obviously that was the whole focus is recovery from, from that kind of a disaster. They weren't able, obviously, to get back on track. Um, they were given a provisional and able to continue working towards their three-year with another year and so forth. So we, we make allowances for situations so those organizations don't wind up with a non-accreditation. A non-accreditation, that would be when there's numerous or major deficiencies in many different areas. There's serious questions about the actual benefit for the health, welfare, and safety of persons being served and staff members. You know, if I'm walking into, for example, an organization I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say it might even be a residential program for kids. And it's the kind of program where I wouldn't want one of my children to, to use the bathroom in, and I just want to walk out. Um, that would be an organization that might not 
achieve an accreditation at all if, if the health and safety were, were that bad. But here's, here's the information that most organizations want to hear right off the bat, and it has to do with fees. Well, CARF, unlike other accrediting bodies, has a very standard, fixed kind of fee schedule. It's not based on any kind of revenue. We do charge for our standards manual, but um, I'll explain later. We, we, we have some ways of being able to help family-run organizations like yourselves. Um, our standards manual is $169. Our application fee, that's $995. Actually, it's gone up about, it stayed the same between 2013 and 2014. It went up $5 the year before that. And then we have a survey fee. And this is how many surveyors will it take to provide you a thorough organization, a thorough survey. So an average survey is two surveyors for two days. And so if you add up the a standards manual, a survey application, and two surveyors for two days, that would be four survey days, that comes out to about 70, maybe $7,200. And that's complete. There are no additional fees. There's no annual fees. There's no membership fees. There's no travel fees in addition to that. The only other thing you might want to consider on top of that could be training. But, you know, CARP has thought long and hard about how we might want to work with family-run organizations, and I have some ideas that we'll talk about at the end of today's presentation. And that's just a quick look at what our standards manual looks like. We have one for behavioral health and one for child and youth services. And all of our standards have, have a, what I call a litmus test. All of our standards have to be achievable and consensual, efficient, and cost effective. I'm not going to read you all of those different areas, but they do have to meet every single one of those areas to become a CARF standard. And when we go through our standards development process, we, we break down each standard and ask it, is this standard practical? Is it actually grounded in our day-to-day -day world of service delivery? Is it relevant? Does it, is it going to make sense to those who have to apply the standards? And is it relevant? Is it going to make a difference overall to people who's actually receiving these services? Is it going to actually help them improve their lives. And I put this slide in here to give you an idea of the standards that would apply to all programs. And these are our business practice standards. This is the standards that are contained in Section 1. And regardless of which standards manual you choose, let's say behavioral health or the child and youth services, all of these areas are included in Section 1. And in Section 2, this is what we call our general program standards, and it covers all of these different subsections. But depending on which program you would choose to accredit, many of these areas would not necessarily apply. For example, if you had, let's say, a prevention program, and you did maybe some outreach and education in a community um, to to the general public. Obviously, you're not doing assessments and individual plans, and you wouldn't necessarily have records for persons served. So we are able to, to apply only certain standards, and there would be whole sections of Section 2 that would not apply to many family-run organizations. And this is what Section 3, the, the specific core program standards look like in child and youth services. And those that are starred are also included in the behavioral health standards. And these are the programs that are included in the behavioral health standards that are not in the child and youth standards. Now, I want to talk just briefly about the standards development process and the how we develop the, the peer, family, and youth support standards, because that's really, I think, why you are 
here today listening to some of this. When we decided, we had input from the field. When we learned of how peer youth and family support standards were being utilized and developed and how Medicaid, back when we first developed these, only eight states had already approved um, peer standards, peer support standards to be reimbursed. Currently now, I think there's about 32 states, Fran, you could probably update that, I'm sure. But we pulled together a bunch of subject matter experts, and you could see the different persons that were represented in this international, sub, um, international standards advisory committee. We had people from, from SAMHSA. We had people from NAMI. We had youth representatives. We had, we had um, the National Federation of Families uh, Certification Commission. Fran was actually there representing. We had substance use providers, mental health providers. We had the VA system. We had numerous providers. And we all went around talking about what, kind, what was needed to ensure that we had standards that would really be supportive and ensure that people who had lived experience would be utilized properly in the field. The first piece that we had to grapple with, though, are these program standards or are these standards that need to be incorporated for all programs that use people with lived experience? And what we came up with is that it didn't matter how people with lived experience were being used in regardless of which program that these standards needed to apply to all programs. So anybody who's used, if you call them a recovery coach, a navigator, a mentor, a youth or a family supporter, these standards have to be applied if the program has anybody who has lived experience. And I want to give you an idea of what these standards address. They have, they have to have policies of peer, family, and youth workforce, policies and procedures. Ethical codes of conduct in the organization have to address boundary issues because we know that those are going to be different for people with lived experience than other staff members. The peer supporters have to be involved in the design, development, and the implementation of services. The peer supporters have to provide specific services that either coincide or complement the plan of care. They're not providing services that are not, that are not integrated with the plan of care. And the services are going to be provided in locations that meet the needs of the person served. And the training. The training that they receive has to be competency-based training, either based on recognized peer support curriculum or developed by peer supporters. So in general, I know Millie talked a lot about this, accreditation is a good thing. Many accreditation bodies have similar practices and focus on quality. But when you make a consideration for choosing, I gave you a few bullet points of different things to look at, but I don't want to take up more time. I want um, Fran to be able to tell you a little bit more about the peer support standards. Here's our website. Feel free to go on there. And um, Fran, I am going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, do we want to make sure that pe if people have questions, they can ask them now? I think it's a way to have questions at the end, unless anyone has something they want to ask them. OK. There aren't any in the Q&A list at the moment, so let's go ahead and proceed. Um, OK, so people can ask in the chat or in the, Q in the QA question, right? Yes. OK. So um, not seeing any questions or anybody typing, I'll, I'll start talking and um, watch to see if there are questions coming up. I uh, began while I was working uh, as part of the Federation of Families um, and developing the standards for individual certification. Uh, Leslie and I started talking about um, some of the barriers 
that are hap that were happening in family organizations. And what we talked about is, and keep in mind this started in probably about 2011, uh, we started talking about some of the, the issues that states were putting to get, uh, forward um, that were likely to create barriers for organizations. Um, we talked about, uh, like in South Carolina, uh, Diane can probably tell you there, there was a lot of discussion about whether uh, a family organization could contract to build Medicaid if it wasn't um, accredited. And we knew then that the issues with accreditation were really onerous for many family organizations, not just not just uh, money and monetary, um, but also just having to meet uh, the CLA or JCO or CARS standards. So um, we went, uh, we started talking about why those reasons why there need to be. Um, support standards in for organizations. Um, and one of the primary things that Leslie and I talked about was that no one was requiring that or recognizing that lived experience was necessary. So that dialogue continued until uh, finally um, when uh, Leslie and Carf uh, decided that they would hold a two-day, essentially, seminar where they invited everyone um, who had a lot of experience um, in the in the fields of adult uh, peer support, family and parent peer support, and youth peer support. And they took a chance and invited, I, I think there must have been about 40 of us there. Um, very vocal people, people like, like Steve Harrington um, in uh, adult peer support. Uh, um, we had, I think, three people from Youth Move. We had a national. Um, we had uh, Sue Burgenson, who has been working with Optum and really trying to push um, the uh, healthcare folks to really address standards. Um, and all of us, you know, said that the reason we need organizations to really have these standards is because they need to recognize that there's lived experience, but not just having had the experience, but knowing how to use that experience and uh, that and recognizing the training. So uh, we talked about what what was needed. We also talked about um, whoops, hold on a second. Um, we talked about why um, what some of the barriers had been um, in terms of organizations using what they call peer support, but not really recognizing the importance of, of that lived experience. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't continue to have places like some mental health centers who hire a uh, parent support person and then uses them only to file paperwork um, because our goal was to make sure that those services had integrity and they were third party billable. Um, so uh, like I said, around 40 of us were invited in for two days. Um, and there was no one there that I believe could stay quiet. So we essentially had a, a the first day a long, long back and forth discussion about the goals of the service of peer support, really talking about how 
that how organizations interfered with develop uh, with providing those services. And from that discussion about how, um, like I said, uh, peer support in, ends up, you know, uh, going to the grocery store and getting food for the meeting or getting used as file clerks or um, parent support providers saying that they can't travel to the person's home or they can't uh, go to a church and meet the family. Uh, as we talk more and more about what those barriers were, what happened is that CARF came back to us with a real, real proposal about what do we expect organizations to do to support the peer service. Um, and it, it was uh, like a lot of discussions that we've had uh, when we've had family organizations together and, and to really come up with good recommendations. Um, I, I can't say enough about how um, both accepting and challenging the CARF staff was by asking clarifying questions to really understand what we knew were the problems and why we needed standards. Um, and I, I'm providing you with two standards examples because um, that kind of gives you a flavor for, for how I believe that uh, CARF really understood that what we needed were standards that, went, that addressed the organizational structure so that parent support providers could, in fact, do their work. Um, so like the peer support services are provided in the location that meets the needs of persons served. What that means is that this is a core belief and that the organization has to understand that they have to, and then their policies have to reflect um, guidance for this to happen. In other words, they, if, they, if they had a policy that said that you can't, you can't drive to a person's home or you can't meet a person in their home, that would not be a, a way to really deliver the service. So in our discussion, what we envisioned is that CARF would be able then to work with the organization and say, those policies have to be addressed. The goal is that uh, the parent support person has to meet the needs of the person that's served and they want to be served in their home and that's realistic. So there has to be a way to do that. Um, it doesn't mean that CARF will say, you have to provide a car for the parent support provider. But it does mean that the organization would have to have some flexibility for how this is done. Uh, they would um, have to be able to um, either allow that or find some other way for the family to, to be able to meet with the parent support provider. The other thing that we knew was a real issue was the issue of boundaries. Um, unlike a clinical program, a parent support program has to uh, really allow for that day-to-day uh, -day sharing, for that transparency between the provider and the family. Um, and what we heard from uh, parent support and adult peer support and youth support folks is that there are some um, traditional organizations that actually have written uh, that parent support or youth support uh, providers cannot disclose the, uh, their personal experience. And, and that would not be in concert 
or an agreement with CARF standards. Um, these two CARF example, if you want, these standard examples are, I think, um, really crucial that CARF and that show that CARF really did understand the, the basic needs of a good program. And like Leslie said, they, they're not prescriptive in the sense that they tell an organization how it has to be done. What they emphasize is that the organization has to figure out how the outcome can come about. Um, how is a person's need being met? Um, how is the parent support provider assisted and supported to meet the ethical code of a parent support person, not a clinical person? Um, and what the, the side product of this, I think, is that it forces the organization to really examine their mission, to examine their personnel and other policies from the top down and from, from the service back all the way through back to the board because it means that organizationally that, organ, that, that agency has to, uh, has to have policies that support the work that, that we believe needs to be done. Um, so I know that when I sat in on uh, the meetings, one of the things I got really excited about was that maybe it, with CARP coming out with standards, maybe that will also push uh, COA and the Joint Commission to follow suit. Um, I, I don't believe I'm speaking for CARF in that, <laughs> on, uh, in that but um, certainly for us uh, that run family organizations, this is going to be crucial. Um, if there are other accreditation agencies, and you all might want to know this, um, and there are two peer-to-peer -peer in particular um, that you might want to look at the standards. And those standards are very similar uh, to what CARF put into their um, administrative um, standards. Uh, uh, Caprice is really for uh, substance abuse agencies. And it started, uh, I think they have five agencies that are accredited nationally. It's very small. And uh, the clubhouse development is real specific to adult mental health, chronically mentally ill that run a uh, clubhouse. So they're really not applicable as standards for, for normal or average um, parent uh, family organizations. But they, you, you might find that useful to take a look at their standards. Getting back to CARP. Um, I think the advantage of the CARF uh, accreditation is um, that it, it does two things. Since it requires that uh, an agency have um, a CARF accreditation for peer support, even if they only have one person. What it means is that the, um, the traditional mental health center is going to have to address their own internal um, policies and procedures so that it really is supportive of, of parent support. It also means that it is likely uh, to support contracting with a family organization to provide the services of supervision and training that it probably doesn't have in its own agency. And that will help them meet the, um, um, the CARF standards. Um, the, other, the other thing, and obviously it's going to help peer-run organizations um, be able to contract for Medicaid as well. So I've given you the advantages here, and um, that was what I was going to do. And Millie, I'll open it up back to you. 
Thank you for your and thank you, Liz. Um, Nellie, you're not coming in real clearly. Um, well, for, I'm going to try mute. There we go. Try muting yours. Uh, sometimes the technology, we're not so good with it. <laughs> um, thank you both for speaking. We can open up the line now for questions, if anyone has them. And if you're not speaking, if you could use it. This is Fran. While we're waiting for people to, to raise questions, um, I sat in on the last accreditation uh, webinar, and one of the things that, is that I was really surprised to hear from Paul, and, and Paul runs AYFN, just, uh, and he followed me as director. And one of the things that concerned me is he talked about having to change how they do business um, in, in terms of having to meet the COA standards of um, case management. And I, I knew about the COA standards when I was first invited to talk, uh, to participate in, with CARP in developing their standards. And, and that's that's one of the things that I probably pushed really hard about uh, when I was participating with CARP is making sure that no matter what standards they develop, it has to recognize that it is training based on lived experience and that it is the use of lived experience um, and that we don't do that. Um, so it's probably one of the reasons why I'm probably more impressed with CAR um, than anything, because they actually heard that and uh, in incorporated it. I don't think we have any more questions. Come up. Um, Leslie, is there anything else you wanted to add? Millie, can you talk directly into your handset? Because you're really hard to hear. Is that improved any? That is good. Okay. Um, and I just heard from Diane that it was not approving until I did that. Okay, I wanted to see, we don't have any questions right now um, in the chat or the Q&A, uh, so I wanted to see if Leslie had anything else she wanted to add about the standards that are specific to peer support, because I don't think any other accreditation agency has developed anything like that. Um, and I think that family-run organizations will be interested um, in what that looks like, um, particularly if their state is pushing them for accreditation. I can go back to the slides um, of the two examples. And Leslie can talk about more if she wants. Leslie, your line may be muted. Uh, Fran? Oh, there we you go. Can yes. also, you can also go back to my slides as well, and I think I've highlighted the uh, specific standards for peer youth and family support. But Fran didn't just push CARF. She bulldozed us. <laughs> she was very, very outspoken, and she had us look at she had us look at issues that really had the entire group examining 
um, topics that were very hard for them to examine, whether or not one's peer, youth, or family supporters went on to get further education. Did that continue? Did they continue to be peer, youth, and family supporters? We looked at areas that were very difficult to look at. We looked at whether or not it had to be external certification or whether or not peer, youth, and family supporters could help design their own competency-based education within the program. Um, so I appreciate the way that, Fran, you did push. Maybe not at the time, but I did wind up really appreciating it. Millie, you started out um, when you were introducing um, accreditation, and I just wanted to point out a couple things that are a little bit different with CARF. You had okay. originally said that most accreditation is a medical model. CARF is really not a medical model, and I did want to point that out. We have so very many programs and that might be why that organization um, that was talking, I guess, in that first webinar might find the CARF standards perhaps a little easier because we don't follow any kind of medical model. So many of our programs don't have a medical component whatsoever and are not, they're not clinically driven. Many of our programs, especially in the child services manual, they're more service driven versus clinically driven. So, but our standards specifically, and just tell me on time because you know how I tend to go over. We have a few more minutes. Okay. Um, the, the issue of boundaries, Fran, that, that you had mentioned, that one was really tough for us. So we hit it actually in two different areas. We talk about it in the terms of the ethical codes of conduct as well as in boundaries. And not only is it important for the organization to have that written down, but it's also important for the rest of the organizational staff to know the difference on how peer supporters' roles will differ. And why can a family supporter can go to the home and they, as the therapist, cannot? Or why can they communicate on the phone or go out to dinner with the family and they cannot? And that's so important. So you have the team really working together versus um, pulling apart and, you know, the playing favorites, and, and which, could usually, which can happen within a team providing services. So I was really pleased to see us come together and hit those boundary issues on those two avenues of both ethical codes of conduct as well as teaching, teaching the rest of the staff. So... Um, I, I think that was really important. Yeah, and I, this is Fran, and I remember we also had a long discussion comparing youth peer support and adult peer support. And um, the youth move folks really being really clear that um, the standard had to say that there had to be supervision and training uh, that met the needs of the, 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 that met both the youth support and the adult support, and those probably were going to be different. And I don't remember how the actual CARF standard came out about training, um, but I do remember us finally being in agreement that it, it met the need. Well, I think what we actually wound up saying is that the, Peer supporters receive the documented competency-based training provided in a manner that is appropriate to the developmental age of the peer supporter being trained. Because understandingly, if we have um, older adolescent peer supporters working with older adolescents, the kind of training they receive is going to be very different than how family supporters receive their training. They're at different levels. As it should yeah, thank, be. Um, yeah, thank you. And it's a yeah. developmentally aged appropriate um, that I, I don't know if people can appreciate that it took a long time to get to that wording. Well, I think it is um, a very good thing for our field that there are agencies such as CARF that are looking at the standards that 
are needed and that fit the work that are done in family-run organizations. So I want to thank you both uh, for sharing this information um, with everyone. Uh, for those that have joined the webinar, um, as Adam said, when we first got started, this will be archived and you will be able to get a copy of the presentation as well as listen to the recording. And the information to contact CARF and to contact Fran or myself or any of the TA partners is included in, in these slides. So thank you again for being part of the webinar today. Um, and with that, we will close up. And I wish everyone a very good weekend.